Hey, you lovely lot, and welcome back to Crime Analyst and the Intelligence Cell. Now, I decided that I'm going to do an update on the Nicola Bully case. The reason being is that I've talked about the case consistently from the first week that Nicola went missing, and there are some updates of sorts. And I think it's really important to still continue to talk about Nicola because almost three weeks on, she's still missing and her children and her family desperately miss her. And it's important that we talk about cases like this because most oftentimes it's the public that solved them. So those people saying, well, why talk about the case? And it's important to, and the police do need to use the public to solve cases and resolve cases. The media have always played a key role. I knew that when I worked at New Scotland Yard. So that's not unusual, but I think the level of media interest now is unusual in the case. And that's causing some problems for the investigation and for the investigative team. And I have some sympathy for that, but I'm gonna come back to that. Because firstly, I just want to tell you about what happened at the press conference. And I did stay up, I did want to watch it, because I did wonder what key information might be imparted. And well, firstly, it was at police headquarters, at Lancashire Police Headquarters. There was Assistant Chief Constable Peter Lawson who spoke. There was also Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith who also spoke at the conference. And there were a lot of media there too. Now, what was basically said, I'm gonna share with you what was said and just some of my thoughts and concerns about where we are currently. So firstly, they talked about the investigation and the scale of it, and that there have been some distractions and that's been unhelpful, but the scale of it, that 1,500 pieces of information have been logged, 300 premises have been searched, 300 people had been spoken with. So again, as I always say, you know, the scale of it is huge and there are now 40 detectives working on it, but are they busy with the right things? That was always something a detective chief superintendent used to say to me. You might be busy, but are you busy with the right things? So are the right questions being asked? Is the right information and tasks being put out into the public to get the right information back? Well, there's still questions about that. And what they did share was that they have had specialist search teams in. We know that they had Peter Fording in finally at the behest of the family who did all the underwater searches with sonar and so forth. And he said that she was not in that stretch of river where the police believed that she may have gone into the water. And in some parts of that water by the bench, it's one foot deep with stone. So the belief is that the river wasn't flooded at the time and there was very little movement. So it would have been very difficult for her body to have moved in 10 minutes to go downstream. It is tidal and to go out into the sea. So they had brought in underwater divers and search teams, also police drones and tidal and environmental experts. So that's important. They have put resources into Nicola's case, but also the question that I have was when did all of this happen? Okay, because the first 72 hours, as I've said before, are really critical in a case like this. And what we learned today from the briefing when Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith took over was that she is the Senior Investigating Officer, the SIO. So I had questions about well, who is actually in overall charge and whether Nicola had been designated a high risk missing person. And that was answered today that yes, she was designated a high risk missing person. And with that comes resources. So once someone's designated as high risk, a senior investigating officer is appointed. So Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith was appointed on the Monday. However, let's not forget it was on the Friday that Nicola went missing. So there is a time gap for me of three days. And I want to come back to that. Those 72 hours are absolutely key, putting out timely, accurate information. And that's when the starburst happens when you get busy. You want it to be in people's minds and thoughts, jogging their minds and their memories at the time where these things are happening. And that's when you actually have a realistic prospect of finding the person that's missing, Nicola in this case. So what Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith said was that it was her working hypothesis from early on that Nicola went into the water. She didn't explain why, but she did say that she was keeping an open mind, that Nicola could have taken herself off, there could be a third party involvement, but her main working hypothesis was that she was in the water. 
The problem with those two statements, my working hypothesis is, and I'm keeping an open mind, is they fight each other. And I believe that that's what has led to a lot of speculation because there's no evidence to corroborate that hypothesis along with saying that, they, that she believed that Nicola didn't leave the area and that they believed there was no third party involvement. When you make those three statements, of course people are interested in what the evidence is to support that, particularly when we know now that there were blind spots on the CCTV. So that's a problem when you're saying that you believe someone's still in an area and three weeks on you still have found no sign of them. There's no car key, there's no hairband, there's no anything that belongs to Nicola to say that she's still in that area. There was the phone, of course, which was found on the bench and Detective Superintendent Smith said that that, that phone, the phone data had been looked at and analysed and it corroborated the movements, Nicola's movements. Of course, there was a witness at 9.10 who knew Nicola and saw Nicola. So it wasn't just believed to be Nicola, it was Nicola at 9.10. That was the last sighting in the upper field. So the upper field has been a area of focus and Re Detective Superintendent Smith talked about that and the, the focus now is on the river path to the Garston Road and I've talked about that before. That's where they're appealing for dash cam footage. So if you are a driver that was on that Garston Road and you have dash cam footage, the police are interested in that. They want positive responses only and I'll remind people of that at the end. So phone data was talked about, the Fitbit data was talked about that I'm very interested in. I did find out from a colleague, Suzanne Baum, that Paul Ansel, her husband, had given her the most up-to-date Fitbit. She was wearing it. She was given that at Christmas. Now, it wasn't synced to the phone and hadn't been for a few days, but I do believe that between five and seven days, you can still get data. It still transmits. I don't know if that's the case here. And the detective superintendent said that, that they didn't get any further information from it. But she did talk about social media. That's Obviously, another really critical line of investigation. Those of you who know about my deconstruction of Gabby Petito's case, 10, 20 parts, and I started off analysing her social media. It gives us clues about someone's lifestyle, about their victimology, about their state of mind. So that's important. So they said that they've taken control of her social media, so don't be alarmed if it looks different. So there's still lines of investigation. She talked about the red van that they're still trying to locate, the fishermen they're still trying to locate, the glove that was found that doesn't have significance to the investigation, the abandoned house that had been searched, the caravan part that had been searched. So she was being very clear in her communication about lines of investigation that, and lines of inquiry that they were still pursuing, but still saying at the same time that they didn't believe, she didn't believe that Nicola um, had come to harm at the hands of someone else. So, and the fact that it's still not being treated as a crime. Well, what was interesting to me was that she talked about Nicola being designated a high-risk missing person from the start. Now, that's what I was interested in. And that's what I wondered whether that had happened. And we found out that on the Friday when Paul reported her missing, that she was deemed high risk, but the SIO appointment didn't happen till the Monday. Why not? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm saying that that 72 window is critical and information could have been given out to the public, a picture of what she was wearing, for example, that they were the critical windows of time, that's 72 hours. And if she was designated high risk, why? Well, what I was particularly interested in, as were many, many other people, was the fact that Detective Superintendent Smith said that she had vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities. Now, that can mean lots of different things. I was training this morning, actually, professionals on coercive control, and I talked about vulnerabilities and how vulnerabilities of a victim can be used against them. And it could be as simple as you're in grief. Someone close to you has died. It could be a myriad of things. But what Detective Superintendent Smith said, she was not going to share that information because it was private. And that is quite right too. The challenge is once something like that is said, people latch onto it and they need to know and they want to know. And she said multiple times she was not going to share that information. Now, also she didn't share why she still believes that Nicola is in the water when there's been an underwater search, when there's been sonar and so on. There was no further information about why she believed that Nicola hadn't come to harm at the hands of somebody else or why she believed that she was still in that area. 
There was no further information. Now, to me, that sounds like speculation. And to lots of other people, it does too. And the problem is, is that then you fuel the fire again and people start mistrusting those statements unless there's something to corroborate and back it up. Now, Detective Superintendent Smith also talked about armchair detectives and how I could see her frustration, even when she was talking about it, how they had distracted and detracted from the investigation. And I would just say that you have to tread carefully in this area because, yes, the police don't need to be distracted with TikTokers and things like that going on and negative things going on online that they then have to investigate. They need to be focused on the investigation. And I have a huge amount of empathy for that. But at the same time, you also need the public on side. And it's a very fine line, particularly with an investigation of this scale and size that has blown up really, and people want to hear more information and they're under pressure. And I could see that Detective Superintendent Smith was under pressure. And it's unfortunate because it comes across as being defensive and almost talking through your teeth and being irritated and bristly and testy and annoyed. And that can detract too. But when you're working long hours, when you're being called to account for things that you don't believe that you should have to, that can create tensions. And I think that often when you speculate yourself, but you tell other people not to, unfortunately, people are then mirroring you and your behavior. And I do believe that it was unnecessary to tell us about the working hypothesis. We don't need to know. The public don't need to know. Perhaps it was unwise to share the information about Nicola's vulnerabilities, because what basically happened at the end of the press conference was that journalists were asking about that. They were also asking about whether she wore earbuds and it was confirmed that she wasn't wearing earbuds at the time, that she would walk along with the phone and that connected to the call and would just be listening, no camera, but just listening to the call. So those were a few things that, that were cleared up, but the vulnerabilities has been a problem, mentioning that and sharing that information. And I want to share with you what happened after the press conference, which in my experience is unprecedented. The police made another statement about those vulnerabilities, and I want to share with you what they said, and I I'm going to read it for you. They said, Nicola in the past suffered with some significant issues with alcohol, which were brought on by her ongoing struggles with the menopause, and that those struggles had resurfaced over recent months. This caused some real challenges for Paul and the family. Now that statement and the framing is concerning for me. And I'm, unco I'm uncomfortable with it because the headlines have since screamed that Nicola has alcohol issues and is menopausal. And quickly we can get into framing victims through that lens that they're unstable and it can be used against them. There is nothing to suggest that she took herself into the water. And yes, her sister raised the question about, did she take herself off? But her Mom, mother and father said she was in a good state of mind. And given that she was on a work call, given that she had texted a friend about a play date, given the fact she had emailed her boss, these are all indicators of someone being present in their life. And yes, we all go through difficulties at times, but I don't believe this information needs to be in the public domain. And my question is, if it was relevant to the investigation, why wasn't it something that was put out within the first 72 hours? Why wasn't it used? Because then if it were used at that time, perhaps there was a chance that it could have actually helped find Nicola. But to release that information now, I don't believe that that was wise to do. I think it feels victim blaming. It feels like she's being framed as being unstable and unreliable and discredits her. And I also wonder about, I saw this when I was in the police, mental health. As soon as someone believes it to be a mental health issue, sometimes police officers disengage. And I wonder what happened on that Friday when that information was imparted to them of how that was then treated. It was designated a high risk case, but what actually happened from the Friday to the Monday to show that resources matched that designation? And I can't answer other than to say that the river, that stretch of river was searched by underwater divers, but I can't talk to other things that happened. Certainly there wasn't a public um, appeal for information. And for me, that's when that information probably would have been most useful. But I feel that this is a, a breach of Nicola's privacy. 
That's my own opinion. I don't believe that we needed to know about it. I also don't believe we needed to know about the working hypothesis. There are reasons why police keep some information to themselves. Other times they need to be accountable and transparent. But why further fan the flames that you are critical of being fanned? And yet, you know, some might say, well, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But if you're calling out other people's behaviour for speculating, it's best not to speculate yourself or release information like this that really has no business being in the public domain, particularly three weeks down the line. So that's why I said on social media that I feel uncomfortable about that information being released now because we know a lot of women get blamed. We've seen numerous headlines. We saw it with Emma and Letty Patterson's case shot dead by George Patterson. And the question in the mail was whether her high powered job as a headmistress overshadowed him. Is that why he killed them? Well, no, that's not why he killed them. So we can very quickly get into victim blame and that's to be avoided at all costs. So I want to keep this short and sweet. I do think the police have got a big job ahead of them. We do need to help them. And by not going up there and tick-tocking and all that nonsense, by not creating more work for them, but by being diligent, if there's information we can share, if we do have dash cam footage, then please do. This is a live ongoing investigation. They do need the public's help. And we're still, well, I want to know where Nicola is and I know her family do, her two little girls do. So where is Nicola Bully? Can you help? If you can, please email the investigation email that's been put together for this inquiry. So I'm thinking about Nicola and I'm thinking about her family. So until next time, be curious, ask questions and always trust your instinct.